Where's that? Come on up, Matt. The eighth grade class is invited for their very special speaker, Matt Hoffman, who's been here for their spiritual emphasis week. So thank you, Matt. while jumping. That was impressive. <laughs> now I also want you guys to know Miss Brady, if she was here, she would be so proud to see you twirl during the reason celebrating. Nice job. Uh, it is a huge blessing to be here. Uh, you're a class that has meant a lot to me over the years, and it's hard to put that into words, but know that it comes from the heart. And I'm definitely going to miss you um, hugely next year. You've just been a huge blessing to me, to Miss Brady, and I know to the whole school and the parents, and I just want you to know that I want to open by saying that. There's a, every graduation, every graduation I go to, there's always a song that comes to mind, and it's from the 90s, and I don't recommend the whole song, but there's one line in that song that always comes to mind at these times, and it's by a song, uh, it's uh, by a group called Semisonic, and the name of the song is Closing Time. And in the song, there's this line, it says, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. And I like to think about that in graduations, because you began a journey so many years ago, many of you here at HCA, and yes, that journey comes to an end tonight, but with this ending comes a new beginning. And I really challenge you and encourage you, as you look back and as you are, have so many memories of this place, don't forget to keep looking forward to what God has planned and God has in store for you in the future. You know, it's exciting, and I'm excited to see where he's going to take each of you. I want to challenge you tonight with a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And before we start, I want to give you just a little bit of a background to it. 2 Timothy, chapter th uh, 2 Timothy the book of it, is Paul's very last letter. Paul is about to die. He knows he's about to die for his faith. And he's writing this letter to Timothy, who is like his son to him, his spiritual son. So when you hear these words, they're basically the words of a dying man. They're the important words that he wants to pass on to the man who will come after him. And so they're filled with meaning to this young man, Timothy. And several years ago, when I was in college, I heard a pastor give a uh, sermon on this on a Sunday morning, the last one before the seniors at the college I went to would graduate. And ever since then, it stood with me. The words that he spoke so many years ago when I was in college have stood with me. And so tonight, I want to share with you from that same chapter of that book, hoping that it will have the same impact and will be what you remember in years to come as well. First of all, Paul starts out in 2 Timothy chapter 3 by saying this. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. There's a happy opening to a graduation speech. <laughs> But don't worry, he continues. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. See, Paul starts out this chapter by saying to Timothy, listen, this is what the world's going to be like. It's not going to be a pretty picture. And when we look around at the world around us, we know that it's not a pretty picture all the time. We know that what Paul wrote 2,000 years ago is a pretty accurate description of the times we live in today. <clears throat> As you prepare to go forth from this place, you will face challenges to your faith. You will be tested. But the good news is that Paul doesn't stop by just describing the world around him. Paul continues and he describes his own life, his own journey as a Christian man. And he goes on and says this, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured? Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Again, don't worry, there's more coming. It's a bit happier stuff. 
Paul, in this part, gives a description of what he has been through, what he has gone through. The Christian life and the Christian journey is not always easy. And high school won't always be easy for you. There will be some great times and there will be some hard times. There will be some fun times and there will be struggles. And there will be challenges to your faith. But Paul says, don't be surprised. Paul says, these are the things that happened to me. And guess what? If you're going to be committed to following God wholeheartedly, it's going to happen to you, Timothy. And it's going to happen to all of us. But again, he doesn't stop there. I was also reminded of a, uh, a book that I read last spring called My Grandfather's Son by Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. And Clarence Thomas describes his childhood. He was growing up in the South, in rural Georgia. And he was raised by his grandfather. And in the summer, Clarence Thomas and his brother would work on the family farm, work on his grandfather's farm. And in his book, he says this. He says, our small, soft hands blistered quickly at the start of each summer. But Daddy, his grandfather, never let us wear work clothes, which he considered a sign of weakness. After a few weeks of constant work, the bloody blisters gave way to hard-earned calluses that protected us from pain. Long after the fact, it occurred to me that this was a metaphor for life. Blisters come before calluses, vulnerability before maturity. As you grow as young men and young women, as you face opposition, as you face challenges in your life, it will be tough. But Clarence Thomas says this, blisters come before calluses. The struggles you go through will make you stronger men and make you stronger women. And don't quit and don't give up. So we've talked about what Paul says the world will be like. We've, cut, we've listened to Paul give his description of his own life. We've heard him say to Timothy, if I faced it, you will face it too. But again, he doesn't stop there. And this is the part I want to focus on. This is my favorite part of this chapter and probably of this whole book. And it's the word that I want to challenge you with and leave you with tonight. He says this to Timothy, his spiritual son. He says, but as for you, as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you have learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The most powerful part of that passage to me is where Paul says to Timothy, you continue. Why? Because you know those from whom you've learned it. You've watched your teachers. You've watched your parents and your grandparents. You've watched them model the Christian life. And from infancy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. You've been in a Christian school for so many years. That word continue is the word that has stuck with me since I heard that pastor give that sermon so many years ago. And it's a challenge I give to you tonight. As you go off to different places, we saw the list earlier of where are you all going. My challenge to you is for you to continue. It's for you to continue. I was reminded of a story about Teddy Roosevelt. In 1912, he was running for election to the presidency, third party candidate at the time. One day he was on the way to a convention center to give a speech, to give a campaign speech. He's driving down the road in an open top of a convertible car. And he's greeting the crowd and waving to the crowd. The crowd's cheering around him. And he stands up and he turns around to the back of the vehicle. And in the crowd there was a man with a gun. And the man reached forward and shot Teddy Roosevelt in the chest. He was thrown backward by the blast down to the seat. Teddy Roosevelt quickly gathered himself. He coughed. He touched the side of his mouth to see if there, blood, there was any blood coming out. And when he realized there was no blood coming out, he figured that the odds were pretty good that he was going to be okay. Now most people, when they get shot, you, think that you would think the first place they would head to would be where? The hospital, right? But, do you know anything about Teddy Roosevelt? 
because he was not the type who would head to the hospital. Teddy Roosevelt was determined to give that campaign speech. So they continued to the convention center. He gave that, that campaign speech. He spoke for an hour and a half, and I promise I won't be that long. <laughs> he gave a 50-page speech, despite everyone around him telling, go to the hospital, you need to see a doctor. He would not even be taken to the hospital in an ambulance. He was going to be seen walking into the hospital and walking out of it. These are some of the things that he said. He said, you get me to that speech. It may be the last one I shall ever deliver, but I'm going to deliver this one. No, this is my big chance, and I'm going to make that speech if I die doing it. I'll not go to a hospital lying in that thing, in the ambulance. I'll walk to it, and I'll walk from it to the hospital. I'm no weakling to be crippled by a flesh wound. The man had just been shot in the chest. But see, there was a man who was so passionate about what he believed that nothing would stop him, not even a bullet. My prayer for each of you young men and you young women is that in the years ahead, you have that kind of perseverance and that kind of determination to continue. Don't let anything stop you. Winston Churchill was the leader of, the, um, of Great Britain during World War II. He was with Great Britain through some of its darkest hours. He was their leader. The people looked to him. In 1955, he was invited to give a graduation speech at Oxford University. The crowd was awaiting the arrival of this important speaker. They gave him this huge, long introduction. The crowd was silent. Winston Churchill, in his typical fashion, had his top hat on, had his cigar, had his cane, walked up on stage. The crowd is hushed. And he slowly begins to speak. And he says this, never Never, never give up. He paused. The crowd was silent. He rose to his feet and again said, Never, never, never give up. Winston Churchill picked up his cap, his top hat off the podium, picked up his cane, put the cigar back in his mouth, and walked off the stage. It's considered the shortest speech, graduation speech in history, but also one of the most memorable. Because there was a man who had lived it. There was a man who had never quit and never given up, even in the hardest of times. And he led his nation through it. I give you that challenge tonight from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul's words to his spiritual son. But as for you, you continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Wherever you go, wherever God takes you, the one word that I always hope you remember is to continue. That's my prayer for you.